So again, you have two weeks for two weeks for uh, finishing up the homework. Um, it might take up to two weeks, depending on your skills. Uh, if you know how to program, might be taking you half an hour. Uh, to us, it takes a couple of hours to, to finish the thing. Uh, again, depends on, on your skills, right? So start early, so you finish early, perhaps, or perhaps you just take the whole two weeks, but you know, up to your skills. All right, I just eclipse and I leave Jan to, <laughs> to give his lectures. Bye bye. Okay. So the first, the first one is a ReLU. We already talked about it. This is the positive part uh, function, sometimes denoted with a, um, kind of a superscript plus, which is really just a max of zero and x. Okay, so it's a function equal to zero when x is negative, equal to the identity when x is positive. It's not everywhere differentiable because it has a kink, um, but as I explained, uh, when we backpropagate, we we just define the gradient as a subgradient, uh, which is a perfectly fine mathematical concept. But there are variants of this. And one issue with the ReLU is that when the uh, when you are in the flat part, there is no gradient being backpropagated through that particular nonlinearity, right? So if the weighted sum coming into or whatever value coming into a ReLU is negative, uh, that ReLU, when you backpropagate through this, will just uh, produce a zero um, as as the gradient uh, going through it because it's flat, right? You can change the input; it doesn't make any difference to the output. Um, and that sometimes can be a problem. Uh, so people have come up with uh, this this other thing, the the R ReLU or ReLU or things like this. And they're basically uh, versions where the the negative part also has a slope, uh, which you know can be trainable or can be um, adjusted or can be set randomly. Uh, it's uh, it's a good idea to have a function that has only one kink because, and that's probably one reason why ReLUs and ReLUs and things like this have become uh, so, so popular is because uh, they're basically um, equivalent to scale. So what does that mean? That means that uh, when the input is multiplied by two, the output is multiplied by two, but otherwise unchanged, okay? Um, I think in mathematics, that's also called homogeneous. Um, so the, the advantage of this is that uh, a ReLU doesn't care about like the amplitude of the variables that come, in, come into it, right? It will, it will fulfill its function regardless. Whereas if you had a function with two kinks, then it really matters the amplitude, you know, the amplitude of the input signal really matters because um, you know, it will determine whether you're using the two kings or only one, for example, right? Um, and that seems to be an advantage, particularly in very deep networks. Right, so the, the, the prelude, uh, so the, the leaky ReLU has a small negative slopes, with, which, you know, you, can't, you can barely see here. Uh, the the prelude has, you know, uh, a coefficient A here that determines the, the slope in the in the negative part, these are still, um, um, you know, contrast equivariant uh, functions. Um, so here's one that isn't con contrast equivariant or isn't uh, equivariant to scale to to amplitude, if you want. And it's soft plus. So you can think of this as kind of a soft version of of ReLU, and the the sharpness of the kink is determined by parameter beta. So uh, so this function, you know, log of one plus exponential beta, right? When beta x. When x is very large, the exponential dominates the one and the log cancels the exponential. So that basically becomes the identity function, right? The one over beta cancels the beta. Uh, and for x negative, then, you know, exponential something negative uh, is close to zero. So this becomes log one, right? And, and that's basically zero. So you can tell that this function smoothly transitions between basically being close to zero to being close to the identity. And the, the, the speed of that transition is this beta parameter. So if you have large beta, it looks very much like a ReLU. Um, you know, it's a little soft at the corner, but it's very much like a ReLU. If you have a small beta, then it's a smoother transition. Um, that's nice. It's sometimes used as a cost function as well. I'll come, I'll come back to that. This is a different way of, of making the uh, ReLU soft and also have a bit of a, of a sort of negative value, uh, which may be interesting 
in some cases. Uh, so as I said, I'm not gonna go through the entire list of all of those variants. Um, you're welcome to, to play with them uh, uh, if, you, if you're interested. Uh, there's sort of various parameterized function that kind of make a ReLU kind of, you know, look more like a linear function or look more like a, like, like, like a hard ReLU. Uh, things that have, you know, funny values for parameters that kind of try to stick two pieces together. Um, you know, lots of, uh, you know, lots of uh, variations. Now this one, uh, I'm showing this one because this one is not monotonic. Uh, it, it sort of goes down a little near, you know, near zero and then and then goes up. It's generally dangerous to do this because if you have a non-monotonic function, it means that it means there are several possible input values that will give the same output values. And backprop doesn't like that very much because that is probably going to create some sort of saddle point or local minimum or something. Um, so people tend to stay away from non-monotonic non uh, function. They don't have to be strictly monotonic, but a monotonic function is a good idea. Okay, so this one is kind of a double, uh, you know, saturating uh, uh, function, uh, which in this case has the, the threshold at six. Why six? Why not? Um, this one is very uh, is used actually fairly widely, so um, it's it's useful to kind of to know about that one. It's called the sigmoid function. Physicists actually call this the the Fermi Dirac distribution. Um, if you put a beta parameter inside of the parenthesis. Uh, and it's um, it, it's a very well-known function. Uh, it's sometimes called a logistic function as well. So it's a function that is equal to one when x tends to uh, in the limit of x uh, going to infinity, and equal to zero when x when x uh, in the limit of x uh, uh, going to minus infinity. And it sort of smoothly transitions between the two. Okay. So if you want some binary variable in your network. A switch, for example, something that decides, you know, A or B or something, right? Uh, like like an elementary classifier, but you want this thing to be differentiable. This is a good function to use, all right? Because it will smoothly transition between zero and one. Um, we'll see in a minute that uh, if you want to activate uh, a particular part of the network and, uh, you know, or, or deactivate it, this could be a good way to compute a coefficient with which to activate or deactivate a part of the network uh, in a differentiable manner. Right, so you know, keep this one in mind because we're gonna use it. Uh, this is essentially the same function as before, except it has a different name and it goes between minus one and plus one instead of zero and one, but it's essentially the same function except you multiply it by two and you shift it by one and then you know, there's a coefficient on the X, which I'm not gonna go through. Uh, it's called the hyperbole tangent. It's also very popular. Uh, this was the standard function that a lot of people were using in neural nets, you know, back, you know, going back to the 1980s and 90s. Most neural nets were using functions like this uh, and not using ReLUs. ReLUs are actually a fairly recent development, you know, less than 10 years, about 10 years. Uh, and it turns out ReLUs are better because of this equivalence to contrast. They're better when you have very deep networks um, for some reason. We don't fully understand why, actually. Uh, th from the theoretical point of view. But experimentally, uh, you can train much deeper networks with values than, than you can with hyperbolic tangent. So hyperbolic tangent, um, you can compute it this way, but most uh, um, numerical um, libraries have just a, a call for hyperbolic tangent that you can use. Um, and the, the advantage of, uh, of this function is that um, uh, you know, because it saturates, it bounds the, the, the values that, you know, your network can take, uh, which is good in many ways, but it has uh, uh, a disadvantage. And the disadvantage is that if, if the variable that goes into the hyperbolic tangent is very large, then you get into the flat spot of this hyperbolic tangent and you basically get no gradient. Um, you know, when, when you backpropagate gradient through that module, you don't get much of a gradient at all. And so uh, for the same reason, the, the flat spot of the ReLU can be a problem. Here you have two flat spots. Uh, and what's more, the, the amplitude of the, of the input variable will depend, like will influence like how much of the flat spot you hit uh, during, uh, during forward propagation. This may be why those, those, using those functions basically limits how many layers you can have because you know, one of those layers is gonna you know, hit those flat spots 
because uh, the weights are, you know, are too large or something, and that's going to kill the entire network. Essentially, you're going to get vanishing gradients uh, be below that. Um, and you don't have this invariance to, to scale. One advantage of this over the sigmoid is that it's symmetric. And uh, for the same reason I explained last week that it's, it's a good idea to normalize the, the variables of a, of a neural net uh, so that they have zero mean. It's also good for the internal variables of a neural net to have more or less zero mean. And so uh, a hyperbolic tangent will produce variables, state variables, you know, neuron outputs that, you know, essentially have zero mean. Not necessarily, but, you know, they have a good chance of being um, uh, centered around zero. Whereas with a sigmoid or a ReLU for that matter, there's no chance at all that they will have zero mean well because they are strictly positive. I mean, not strictly, but they're positive. Um, so because of the saturation problem of the sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent, um, our, our friend in Montreal a few years ago uh, proposed this other kind of smoother function that doesn't transition as fast and still has a slope uh, when it saturates. It's called a soft sign. Uh, so it's x over 1 plus absolute value of x. Uh, this is, I believe, a paper by Xavier Glo and Yosha Benjo. Uh, and, you know, that has some advantages. So some people use it. Hard 10H, um, <laughs> this should really be called the, a ramp, saturating ramp. So this is just a saturation function, right? It goes between minus one and one and it's linear in between and there is two kinks. So it has, again, the disadvantage that uh, it's not um, a scaling variant. So then you have weird functions that don't tend to saturate, but they, 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 they sort of bring the value towards zero, right? So this is a function that if you give it a small value, it will basically return something that's really close to zero. And if you give it a bigger value, it's close to the identity, you know, minus uh, or plus a constant. So this, this one the, is called the, the, the 10H uh, shrink, and it's the difference between the identity and, and hyperbolic tangent. It's kind of a hard version of it called a soft shrinkage. Uh, this is used in sort of very weird cases that we may talk about um, when we talk about unsupervised learning, uh, in sparse coding in particular. Um, and hard shrink, but this one, you don't want to use it with backprop because it's not even continuous. Okay, then you have kind of, uh, you know, variations of, of those. So this is the, the log of a sigmoid. Why is it good to have a log of a sigmoid if you have the sigmoid and the log? The reason is because of numerical instabilities. So it's very often the case that you will have functions with exponentials in them, and then you want to take the log of them. And if you, if you write them in PyTorch as two different modules, one that computes this function with exponentials and one that takes a log, you're going to get numerical instabilities. Uh, there is some values of the input for which, uh, you know, the output will be almost zero and the log will basically want to be minus infinity. Uh, but if you do the computation in one swoop um, and, and you can rearrange the term, you never get those numerical issues. Uh, so taking the log of a sigmoid is an example of that. Okay, now we're getting into modules that uh, are not simple uh, nonlinearities, but they're very important because they're used absolutely everywhere, but they're modules that turn a vector into another vector, okay? And there's two of them, softmax and softmin. Uh, they basically are the same thing. They should really be called arg softmax and arg softmin, uh, but historically they've been given the name softmax and the, the name stuck. Uh, it's, it's really not a good name for that, but um, uh, in fact, the inventor of, of, of that uh, technique in the context of neural net is a guy called John Bridle. Uh, and he regret calling them softmax and softmin. He said, I should have called them arc softmax and arc softmin. So they're really the same function, except, uh, you know, one has a minus in it. Uh, and they, uh, they are, they're vector functions, okay? So... Um, and Jan is frozen? Or is my computer frozen? Yes. My computer is frozen. No, Jan is frozen. Jan is frozen too. Okay. Very good. So let me, until he comes back. Uh, so like the documentation of Torch is uh, huge. And then most of the time we get like people that are overwhelmed about like, oh, how do we use this? How do we use that? Um, so the documentation doesn't really tell you how to use these uh, functions. And so in uh, 
we are we're trying now to briefly cover like to just go over everything such that whenever you're going to be uh, looking at the documentation because you're going to be looking at the documentation uh you know quite often at least you can navigate and, and figure out and understand why those things are there okay can you provide some examples that uh, non-monotonic loss functions will lead to problems? I have no idea. Uh, that was the first time I hear <laughs> about that. So we can ask Jan when he comes back. Uh, it's going to take a few minutes, he said. OK, fine, I entertain you for that for, for the moment. Um, so so that, that, that I don't know. Like I, I have no uh, personal experience about non-monotonic loss functions. Uh, can I address other uh, questions? Why is relu considered uh, when it's not differentiable? So, okay, this is actually so cool. Um, if you have a neural net made of uh, relus only, you can actually show that the outcome of this network is going to be simply a piecewise a linear interpolation of like several uh, linear networks. Okay. And so what happens is that like a given network will, uh, section the input space and apply a linear transformation from that input to the output. Okay. Uh, and so there are no, uh, like for, for the given patch, you're going to have like a linear network. It's, which is, uh, straightforward to train. And the only thing basically that you are uh, doing during training is going to be like basically figure out where to position those patches and then what kind of transformation you would like to uh, apply to those regions. Okay. Um, but of, of also, yeah, yeah, like, um, like theoretically speaking, this uh, Relu based neural net are much easier to analyze. Uh, Relu is differentiable. Actually, yes, Relu is differentiable. It has, you had to use subgradient, yeah. Uh, but again, the issue with Relu uh, is that you have exactly zero gradient for the negative part. Uh, and then if you get in that region, also things don't move, right, with the gradient. So instead, we, are, we, uh, we have to use, for example, leaky Relus. Uh, when we train, let's say, a generative adversarial network, which we we'll cover uh, towards the end of the class, uh, such that you always have some gradients flowing through the network. Okay, so again, Relus might give you some issues uh, because of the zero gradient side. So we just give a, a small kink, like a small sorry a slope, such that you still have gradients. And then there is a question for Jan. Um, so can you mention? Can you hear me? Right, Jan. Yep. Okay. Can you mention a few uh, issues about the fact of the of using non-monotonic uh, activation functions? That it was not clear. Ah, uh, right. So let's say let's say you're using a, a non-monotonic activation function, something like a absolute value, for example, right? So it's like the ReLU, except it's you know pos uh, identity in the positive part, negative identity in the in the negative part. Um, so there, uh, whenever the, the output of the network wants the, that particular unit to have a, a particular value. It's got two choices as to what the input should be, okay? And which one it chooses depends on just what the current value is. And this may or may not be good uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the, the gradient could, could take you in one direction or the other direction. Um, let's imagine that the, the nonlinearity you put is a sinusoid, okay, with <laughs> multiple periods. There is lots of different places that the input can be that will produce exactly the same output. Um, and so it doesn't pin down the value of the input. It just says, you know, the, the, the input should be either this or that or that. Uh, and that creates local minima necessarily because, or saddle points, because it means there are several choices to get the same result, which means there are several values of the parameters that will give you the same output, which means there are several local minima. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there is this sort of intuition that local minima are probably a bad idea, that several points certainly are bad. And so the more non-monotonic non-linearities non you put in your system, the more of those local minima or several points you're going to create. And that's probably bad. 
Okay, and there's one there's one more question. Uh, we've before mentioned that using those uh, saturating nonlinearities are leading to a possibly van vanishing gradient. So isn't a ReLU perhaps leading to exploding gradients instead, since it's not saturating? Uh, so not necessarily uh, exploding gradient. Okay, the gradients would explode if. Um, so for example, imagine a network that uh, has you know, a single input, single hidden unit, single hidden unit, et cetera, right? So you're kind of repeating, uh, it's a very simple network with a, basically a single hidden unit um, at every layer, right? And you stack the layers. Uh, if you put a ReLU uh, at, each, at each layer and the weight is, is one, let's say, for every layer, you're not gonna, you know, as you back propagate, the, the gradient uh, will say, and, and let's imagine the input is, is positive, so all the values and all the weights are one, so all the values are in the linear region. Uh, when you back propagate, the gradients will also be one, right? Because you're going to get the, the gradient multiplied by the derivative of the ReLU, which is one, uh, then multiplied by the weight, which is one, then by the you know, slope of the ReLU, which is one, et cetera. So the gradients are going to be one uh, everywhere. Now imagine that the weights are not one, but are two, okay? So all the weights in each of the networks, uh, in each of the layers, are equal to two. Uh, so first of all, for an input equal to one, uh, after that you get um, you get two, then four, then eight, then sixteen, etc. Right? You get powers of two as you go up the layers. So mm -hmm. you get an exploding state, uh, and the gradient uh, also explodes. So if you put a if you start with a gradient one from the output, uh, you back propagate you you back propagate through uh, a weight equal to two. So your gradient is now two and then four, and then eight, and then 16, right? So you get a huge gradient here for the lower layers um, that have, um, you know, which means the, the weight here is gonna change a lot. And a relatively small gradient for the top layer, which means, you know, the, uh, that weight is not gonna change much. Uh, and so that's a bad idea. What you want is you want the, the amplitude of the states and the amplitude of the gradient to be more or less the same all the way through. And what people do uh, to kind of enforce this today is they use a module called uh, batch normalization or or group normalization. I mean, there's sort of various normal, normalization trick tricks to ensure that the uh, activities of of the of the units are you know more or less all the same. They have you know variance one roughly, right? Uh, so that's a way of kind of preventing this from happening. Uh, so the the the, the explosion is not necessarily going to be due to the to the ReLU. Like if you use an exponential for the nonlinearity, yes, you're going to get exploding gradients. But uh, but a ReLU just has a, a slope of one, so that that that's not necessarily going to create uh, issues. Um, you can have that issue because of you know gains inside the network that are that are bigger. Okay, uh, can we take one more uh, question? We can. Okay, so could the non-monotonicity actually be a good thing? For example, it could mean that there are multiple weighting initializations which could work instead of getting stuck due to a bad weight initialization. Uh, yeah, that's right. So it's just that again, you're going to have several points if you uh, if you have those uh, uh, those those, those non-monotonic functions, and several points are bad. So it may work. Like it depends what type of function you're using. You know, the, not a huge amount is known about this. <laughs> what, okay. what is known is that is that with monotonic, monotonic function, particularly with red use, there's a little bit of theoretical results on why, you know, intuitive, you know, the intuition that why they're good kind of translates into some very weak theorems on on why they're good. Um, but but really, those are you know really complex. Uh, systems with complex dynamics that people don't understand very well. Now, what you can think about the the a way to think about the ReLU is is as a uh, if you know anything about electrical engineering is a diode. Okay, so it's like you know something that lets values that are positive but not negative. And this is sort of the most elementary way of detecting something, if you want, right? The most elementary way of detecting something that happens versus something that is not that does not happen is if you have some sort of linear representation of it is you have a threshold and below that threshold things are equal to zero and when they're positive they're positive this is the basic principle of you know a radio for example right you build a you build a radio and you want to uh, detect the signal so that you can hear the audio and eliminate the carriers 
you have to have a diode. You have to have a detection system that's um, called a diode in electronics, and it plays the same role as a value. And Alfredo is going, oh, funny, I never thought about this before, even though I'm an electrical engineer. Um, that's, the, the name, the, that's where the name comes from, right? The rectifying. Rectification. Yeah, yeah, rectification. Diode is actually called a rectifier. Uh, yeah, yeah. More general term for it. Uh, um, one last question, uh, since this actually, I, I heard about this paper. Uh, any thoughts about the SIREN uh, paper, the one that is using si sinusoidals uh, for the activations? Science. Oh, that's different. Uh, this, no, no. Uh, so it's not an activation. The, the SIREN paper, if I remember correctly, right? So this is a paper by, uh, uh, he's a I mean, he's at Google, but he was at, he was at Berkeley for a while. Um, uh, okay, the, the, the Vincent idea is that, Sitz, uh, Vincent Sitzman, uh, Martel, Berg, Bergman, Lindel, and Betstein. Bet okay, these are not the names I remembered. Okay. Okay, but there, there, there was an earlier paper, I think, the, from the NERF people on, on like four year representations. Okay. Okay, so I think. Uh, so I may be confused about what Sarin actually had, uh, the Sarin paper talks about, but I think what it is is that it's basically a pre-processing layer. So let's say you have a neural net that has a single, a single input, a scalar input, okay? And you want to compute some complex function of that single input. You could, you could just build a, a neural net with you know, a number of hidden units and several layers and, and put the output. But, but what they do is that um, one thing you can do, uh, which seems to be very useful, is that you hardwire the first layer. So the first layer is basically hardwired and it's very similar to the uh, basis function expansion I was talking about last week when I talked about like hardwiring the first layer. And what you do is you, you make this uh, activation function for this guy uh, be equal to a sinusoid. And for this guy, it's a sinusoid with twice the frequency, and for this guy, three times the frequency, and for this guy, four times the frequency, et cetera, right? Um, so you have uh, activation functions that are, uh, you know, sinus x or some coefficient, uh, sinus 2x, sinus 3x, et cetera. And for good measure, you also add the cosine. So cosine x, cosine 2x. So you basically expand the dimension of the input, right? Um, and that's basically, uh, that would be sort of a, a Fourier series expansion of, the, of, of your function. So it makes it easier then for the system to compute a complex function by basically computing weighted sums of those basis functions. Okay. And you finally- Polynomials, you can do this with all kinds of stuff, yeah. Finally, why are we covering all these activation functions in today's lecture? <laughs> We're not covering all of them. We're just covering the ones that people use. Okay. I, oh, put, like I, said, okay. I put the slides for all of them because, you know, that, that's a good reference. But, okay. uh, but that's basically, you know, you, you can find this in the PyTorch uh, manual. Yep. Uh, okay. So here's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about softmax, right? Um, so by the way, my computer crashed when I tried to grab my little pen here and I disconnected one of the connectors that has a USB to everything else and it just completely crashed the machine. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so softmax is this thing. Uh, it's a module that has N inputs and N outputs and it computes the exponential of each input and then normalize them by the sum of the exponentials of all the inputs, right? So, uh, so basically, uh, let's say we have three inputs. These are the xi's and uh, or xj. I should I should talk. I should say and 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 these are the uh, sorry, not the x's, but the z's. I'm going to call them z, zi. Okay, so zi is equal to um, exponential xi over sum over j of exponential xj. Right, so each of these guys, okay, is you take the exponential of the corresponding input and then you normalize by the sum of the exponentials of all the inputs. Now, what does that, what does that give you? Um, 
it basically allows you to transform a bunch of numbers between zero and one, uh, a bunch of numbers, the, the XIs, whatever they are, into another bunch of numbers, the Zs, that are between zero and one and sum to one. Okay, so it's quite obvious that when you sum all the Zis over i, you're going to get one, right? Because you're going to get the same thing on the numerator and the denominator. Okay, so the sum of the Zis is going to be one. Uh, and they're all going to be between zero and one because, of course, the sum of the exponential xj's is larger than exponential xi. So this is a way of turning, and it, we're going to use this absolutely everywhere, okay? So it's very important. Um, so this allows us to turn, for example, a bunch of scores in some arbitrary unit into things that look like a probability distribution over a discrete distribution, over a discrete uh, outcomes, okay? Uh, so here's a, uh, a special case of, of this. Let's imagine that we only have two inputs, okay, x1 and x2. So z1 is going to be equal to, uh, you know, e to the x1 over e to the x1 plus e to the x2, okay? Cool enough. Now let's imagine that um, uh, X2 uh, is always equal to zero. Okay, it's constant and equal to zero. Then this turns into E to the X1 over E to the X1 plus one because exponential zero is one, right? So if I divide by e to the x1 above and below, uh, which means I multiply by e to the minus x1, okay? I get one because they cancel. Here I get one also because they cancel. And here I get e to the minus x1. And surprise, surprise, this is the sigmoid. Or the logistic function. or as physicists call it, the Fermi-Dirac distribution. Okay, so now what we've just seen is that the softmax basically is a multi, multinomial generalization of the logistic function. Or conversely, the logistic function is a special case of softmax for two variables where one of them is always zero. Okay. And why are we using exponentials here as like our nonlinear function? Because the exponential is a very simple way of smoothly turning a number from any, with any range from minus infinity to plus infinity into a positive number, right? There's many ways to do this, I, I would admit, uh, but exponential is good. Um, There are other deep reasons for this, okay? Um, <laughs> but which I'm not going to go into right now. We say about this a bit in a, in a, in a future lesson, right? Yeah, we'll talk about, you know, basically when we, when we talk about um, energy-based models and, and their relationship to probabilistic models. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, intuitively, it's a good way of turning a bunch of scores into a probability distributions. A probability distribution. So if you are interested in having calibrated scores that are between zero and one and sum to one, if you want to do classification, for example, okay, you use a softmax module because you get whatever score come out of your neural net, and then you turn them into a bunch of positive numbers at sum to one, and you can interpret this as a probability distribution over categories. Um, okay, why is it called softmax and what should it be called soft argmax? Uh, the reason is that, uh, uh, if all the x's are very small, okay, let's say large and negative or, or whatever, let's say all the same values, and one of them is significantly larger than all the others, then what's going to happen is that the, the output is essentially going to be very close to one for that, for that input that is much larger than the other, and it's going to be close to zero for all the other ones, okay? Uh, 
And so that basically creates a kind of competition, if you want, between the between between scores. And the interesting thing about uh, about softmax is that softmax doesn't care about a, a shift in the variables. So uh, if I take uh, if I take a vector x and I add uh, another vector v to it, okay, a constant vector. Uh, I mean, I I, I add a, a constant to to every term, right? So the uh, this is not just a constant vector v; it's a it's a vector that has the same value uh, everywhere, right? So let's say I add c to all the components, right? And I compute the softmax of that. This is actually equal to uh, softmax of x. Okay, so take a vector x, add a constant to all the inputs, it makes no difference to the output. So what that tells you is that softmax actually only cares about the relative values of the inputs, doesn't care about absolute values of the input. If your inputs are, uh, you know, between minus one and one, or they are between, uh, you know, one million minus one and one million plus one, it doesn't make any difference to softmax. It's going to make a numerical difference when you compute the exponential, but that's a different story. In fact, PyTorch is smart about this. Um, it's not gonna blow up. Um, so uh, that's a really important property. And um, that's quite interesting. So now uh, the, the soft min function I was talking, telling you about. So this is why it's called softmax, right? Because basically, and that's why it should, it should be called soft argmax. Uh, because basically it tells you which of the values in the list of values is the largest one. It gives it gives it a value close to one, and then it gives the other values uh, a value close to zero with some smooth transition. Uh, if you want a non-smooth transition, you can apply softmax to x, which you multiply by some coefficient beta, right? So for a very large value of beta, which would be a coefficient that you pick, which you can learn also if you want, but you can you can set it. Uh, for large values of beta, the transition between zero and one, when x uh, you know grows larger than the one particular component grows larger than all the other ones, would be very sharp. Okay, so set beta to a thousand or something. Uh, if one x is only slightly bigger than the other x's, its softmax output would be one, and the other ones would be zero. Okay, for a small value of beta, you're going to have a smooth transition as you increase one of the x's. Um, relative to the other ones, you can have a smooth transition between between zero if if the that component is much uh, smaller than all the other ones, to one if it's much larger than all the other ones. Um, so softmin is just um, softmin of x is just softmax of minus x. Okay, so that's a generalized form, right? Which uh, when you have uh, uh, a beta uh, and that that um, kind of takes care of you know negatives versus positives and stuff like that. Um, so if beta is negative, you're going to have a negative in front, which you know may or may not be what you want. Right. So for the same reason that I, I told you that uh, if you want to take the log of a function like this, you you better do it in one fell swoop rather than sort of computing the function and then taking the log because. You might have very large numbers, you know, in between, and particularly when you backpropagate gradient, you get essentially zero gradient or infinite gradients. Uh, you backpropagate gradient to a softmax, you will get uh, if one x is very is much larger than the other ones, you get you you basically the softmax basically saturates. So when you backpropagate, you get gradient zero, uh, and you know it could be that. You know the log of a, uh, you know the output of the softmax is close to zero. When you take the log, you get something that basically is you know minus infinity. So when you do everything in one fell swoop, you don't have that numerical problem. Uh, there's a trick uh, inside of uh, PyTorch, and the trick is that uh, you you kind of reduce this uh, computation of the softmax by first computing the the max over the xi's, and then you can factor. Uh, what what goes on inside and and solve the numerical problem. So log softmax is probably one of the most important modules inside of uh, uh, inside of PyTorch. It's one that's used universally for classification. Okay, when you build a neural net, 
you use the loss you use the log soft max module essentially as as an as a cost function. Uh, <clears throat> you don't use directly you know directly as a loss function, but it's basically the main component of a loss function. Um, so what does that do for you? Um, so as I said, it uh, the softmax itself turns the the values, the scores coming out of the neural net, uh, whatever they are, into a bunch of numbers between zero and one that sum to one. Uh, and then you take the log of that uh, and you're back in the same space as the original X inputs, basically, because you know the log kind of cancels the exponential. But what you have done is that you've removed the absolute values of the Xs. So as I said, softmax really cares only about relative values of Xs. Um, and so now what you have is a bunch of scores that really indicate the relative values uh, of the x's without caring about their uh, absolute value. Uh, and that's um, very important if you have, if you want to uh, build a classifier and the classifier has multiple categories, you need to have some competition between the different categories because an input, an image uh, can only have one category, okay? If it's a mutually exclusive uh, categories. And so what you like is you what you like scores that you know basically are like probabilities and kind of uh, uh, inhibit each other, right? If one category has a high score, the other one should have a uh, low score, and that's what the softmax normalization does. Um, but um, but then why do we need the log? Okay, so um, let me. Uh, so I guess it's time to talk a little bit about a particular type of standard uh, classifier architecture, right, of neural net. So you would have uh, an input X, um, an image, audio, whatever it is, you know, think of it as a, you know, it would be a multidimensional array of some kind, but we're going to think of it as a, as a vector. Then we'll have, you know, multiple layers of modules, whatever they are, I'm not going to specify here, it doesn't matter. Uh, in a standard neural net, again, they're going to be, you know, uh, linear modules and uh, ReLU modules. The last one being a linear, not a ReLU. And then we're going to put one of those softmax module. Okay, and this output, which is the predicted output, is really going to be is really going to be a vector of numbers between zero and one that sum to one. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of redrawing this softmax module here. Okay, in comes a bunch of numbers that come out of the linear module that's before. Out come a bunch of numbers between zero and one that sum to one. Um, so if you want to train this to classify it as a classifier. Uh, what you want is uh, you want to train the system in such a way that the output for the correct class is close to one and the outputs for the incorrect classes are close to zero. Uh, so what you can use is a cost function. So basically, you know, the output here is going to be, I don't know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.6, uh, and 0.1, okay? And and let's say the the desired output is something like zero, one, zero, zero. So first of all, your system got it wrong because it gave the highest score to uh, the third category and the correct category is actually the third, the, the second one, not the third one. Uh, so what we're gonna need here is some sort of cost function that measures the divergence between those two things, okay? I don't want to say the distance because this may not be a distance, but some measure of discrepancy between those two things. Um, and that's again one of the most important modules we're gonna we're gonna use. So one cost that we could use is squared error. Okay, so squared error says, um, you know, I'm I'm going to just compute the the sum of the square of the difference differences between the value I get and the value I want, uh, and that might work. But um, in classification, people use uh, something called a, a binary cross-entropy. And that involves log softmax, okay? So, um, okay, so before I go there, um, I wanna tell you something about this. 
So what happens here is that all those numbers compete with each other, right? Because they are normalized by their sum, they compete with each other. So if the network wants to increase the value of, of the, the second output here, which is, you know, which is the, the correct one, it will have to decrease the other one because it's normalized. Okay. Um, and that, that's the advantage of softmax for kind of mutually exclusive, uh, for cl classification mutually exclusive classes. I want to maximize the, the, the negative log of the correct output. So, you know, this target here, one, says, I'm just gonna, uh, if we wanna translate this into an objective function, it's going to say, I want to pull this value up. And as a side effect, the other values will be pulled down because, you know, it's all normalized. So I just wanna make this large, okay? And what am I gonna use as a loss function to make this value large? Uh, the answer is I'm gonna use the minus log of it. Okay, so, uh, so those are the, the Y bars, okay. So my loss, my, my objective function, which I'm going to minimize is the minus log of the activation coming out of the softmax of the correct output. Okay, so C here indicates the correct class. the correct category, the desired category, right? Um, so in this case, it's, you know, index, uh, it's the second one, which is index one, right? Because we start at zero. Uh, so here, C equal one, because um, um, it's, it's the second output. I want to make this output of the softmax as large as possible. And the way I make it as large as possible is that I plug it into a loss function that is the negative log of this output. And if I, if I minimize this negative log, I'm going to maximize the, the YC, the point two is gonna get bigger. And as a consequence, the other ones are gonna get smaller because it's normalized, okay? We, that's why I need to compute the log softmax. That's because it's gonna get into my loss function. So the log softmax of the correct category, minimizing the negative log softmax of the correct category is the main way to train a classification system uh, in, in deep learning. That's what most people use. Um, I'll come back to this in a second. Okay, so that's why log softmax is so important. And in fact, we're coming to cost functions. So those are things we, we stick on top of a neural net uh, to tell us whether the neural net is doing something good or a deep learning system to tell us whether it's, it's, it's doing something good. Uh, the most common one is the, the squared error. So the squared error is simply uh, the squared difference between the um, output we want and the output we get. Uh, and they're using different notations here and they're doing it over a batch. So this uh, index one over one to N is, uh, is uh, index over, over a batch. Uh, and you compute either the sum or the mean, uh, you can choose. Uh, by uh, with this sort of reduction um, uh, parameter, oops, sorry, uh, whether you compute the, the sum of the mean over, over the batch, oops. Uh, but what you do is you compute the square, um, the square difference of each component, okay? So very simple. Uh, whatever comes out of your neural net, is a bunch of outputs. The cost function is the uh, MSE, mean squared error. You get desired values. Okay, so let's call those uh, the YI bars, and those are the YIs. Okay, this is a different notation from the one used in the PyTorch manual, and you just compute uh, one over, uh, uh, I don't want to call it P actually. I don't want to call it N either. Um, K, which is the number of outputs here. Uh, sum over I of, uh, of, sorry, YI minus YI bar, which is the output of the network squared, okay? Uh, or you can just write this as one over K square norm of 
of y minus y bar. Okay, so it's really the Euclidean distance averaged over components. Uh, so if you're doing regression, so basically if your neural net uh, is trained to produce continuous values of some kind, not classification, but regression, that's a perfectly good uh, cost function to use. Okay, very simple. Uh, this is the same thing, but instead of the L2 norm, we use the L1 norm. So this is the sum of the absolute values of the difference. Not very, not used very often, but used sometimes. Um, Variants of this, which I'm not going to go into the details of. And here is the negative log likelihood loss, which is a special case of which is the log softmax I was talking about earlier. Okay, so uh, we have a target category. So we want to use this for classification. We have a target category, uh, and uh, which is this uh, uh, little c here. Uh, and we want to make the uh, output of the correct category as large as possible and the other ones as small as possible. And if the outputs come out of a softmax, we can reduce this into, uh, into a, a, uh, a single function, which is the log softmax, right? So I explained that earlier, right? We want to make the correct output as large as possible. Uh, and the way we do this is by minimizing the negative log of it, okay, which is negative log likelihood, if you want, of the correct category. Uh, but if we do this as two separate modules where we compute softmax and then we have uh, negative log likelihood, uh, we get numerical issues. So what we do is we compute the log softmax and, and then we just, uh, uh, you know, maximize the correct output or the negative log softmax and then minimize the correct output, which is the same. And that can be seen as uh, a special case of the uh, cross entropy loss. So here is the, the expression for the softmax. And this is the negative log softmax, which is a negative log likelihood loss applied to a module uh, with softmax, right? Uh, where the last module is softmax in one fair swoop. So I can develop this. Um, if I take the log of this exponential, right? So the, the log of a ratio is the difference of the logs, right? So I can write this as log of the numerator minus log of the denominator, right? Now the numerator has log of exponential which cancel each other, so I just get the score of the class with a minus in front, okay? So this is the first term. And then the second term is the so-called log partition function, which is the log of the denominator or minus, you know, yeah, the log of the denominator. So the overall objective function is something like this. It says, uh, make the score, before the softmax of the correct class as, as large as possible, because you have this minus sign, okay? And then makes the, make, all the, make the log of the sum of the exponentials of all the, all the scores, including the correct one, but with all the incorrect one, as small as possible, which means make those scores as small as possible, as negative as possible, okay? So this, so the reason why this is interesting to look at is because this is going to be the gradient you're going to get when you backpropagate gradient through of a, non of a negative log likelihood loss through a softmax, through a log softmax in, in, in that case. Um, this is the kind of gradient you get with respect to whatever variables enter the softmax, okay? So to minimize this, you need to minimize the first term, which means make the x of the correct class as large as possible, okay? So make the score of the correct class as large as possible. Simultaneously, make the scores of all the classes as small as possible, including the correct one. So the, the score of the correct class is gonna be get pushed down, simultaneously with being pushed up, but it's gonna get pushed up by this term much stronger than is being pushed down by that term. And we'll see why in a minute. Um, so you're going to get the desired effect in your neural net, you know, going um, going down, which is that you know the the correct class is going to is going to get pushed up, and incorrect classes are going to get pushed down. The, the scores, if you want. Uh, so there are various tricks because people want to use uh, uh, softmax 
with a very large number of categories. So for example, let's say you want to train uh, a, uh, a, a, a spell corrector or uh, a language model. So something that will predict, um, um, you know, you, you'll type, you type an email and this thing is going to predict what, what word you're likely to type next. What you need is a language model, which is something that will, pre you know, basically predict a probability distribution of all, all the possible words in the language you're typing in. It's going to look at your previous, uh, previously typed word in the text, and it's going to predict what word comes next, so that you know it proposes you the the most likely one uh, coming out of, the, of that model. Uh, a more useful actually utilization of those uh, language models uh, is uh, uh, you're doing speech recognition or uh, handwriting recognition or something like that or text generation, uh, and the system doesn't have perfect identification of the words. Um, uh, and what you want is a language model to correct the mistakes, okay, of, uh, of, your, of your recognition system. So, uh, so that's called a language model, a probability language model. And the problem with this is that you need the system to produce a probability distribution over a very large number of categories because the number of possible words in the English language is, you know, the most common words is like 100,000 or something like that, right? And the full dictionary is more like 300,000, if not more. So uh, you need to do a softmax over 100,000 variables and that can become kind of expensive. Uh, sometimes you might need to do a softmax over a million uh, uh, entries. And that's kind of numerically unstable and expensive. So there are tricks to kind of do this fast by basically ignoring the, the, the things that have low scores. And that's, that's one of them that you, you're welcome to use. I'm not gonna go into the details of how this works. Um, so here is another kind of loss that can be used for classification as well. And it's called a, a, a margin uh, ranking loss uh, or ranking loss with a margin. Uh, it's basically a difference, addition of a constant and then a value, okay? <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. You can see the formula at the bottom. And what it says is that, uh, you know, if I have a network with multiple outputs and two scores come out of the, uh, of the, of the system, uh, I know that the correct category is one of them is is one of them, and I want to make sure that my system produces the correct category. So what I want to do is I want to make the score of the correct category as large as possible, not as large as possible, but I just want to make it slightly larger than the second uh, highest scoring category, right? So that's called a ranking loss. So you you have a you have a neural net. It may have ten or a thousand outputs. Uh, and what you're doing is that you, you, you're saying uh, which output is the correct one, okay? I want to make that big. Which output is the largest one among all the outputs, whether it's the correct one or incorrect one, I don't care. Let's say it's another one, okay? Maybe its score is higher, maybe it's lower, I don't care. But what I want is I want to make sure that the score of the correct class is larger than the score of that other class that has a high score by at least some margin. So I can use this loss, okay? I pick X1 and X2 as being the correct one and the, uh, and the, most, offending in, the most offending incorrect one, for example, right? And I, I push the first one up and push the second one down in such a way that the difference is at least a margin. And so now I'm guaranteed that uh, if my network you know, learns properly, then uh, the correct category will have a higher score than the, the other, all other categories by at least that margin. Okay, so that's another one of, of, of those losses that only cares about differences, doesn't care about absolute values, only cares about differences between, uh, uh, between scores. Um, but it's not like softmax because it doesn't take into account the entire set of, uh, of outputs, it only takes a pair. So architectures really are different ways of arranging modules to build uh, neural nets. Uh, any question at this point, by the way? We've been covering, uh, answering questions on the chat on the fly. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, um, we'll we'll jump right in. Uh, okay, so they, you know we've we've talked about linear modules. We've talked about um, we've talked about uh, pointwise nonlinearities. We talked about softmax. We've talked about a few cost functions: least square, mean squared error, and uh, negative uh, uh, log likelihood applied to softmax, which gives you the log softmax, right? Um, but here is another set of modules that you know are quite different from what we just uh, we just uh, talked about. Those are kind of quadratic modules, if you want. 
Okay, so here's an example of a quadratic module. It's a module where the output, the ith output, is a weighted sum. Uh, so, so here, this is a linear module, right, where we compute just a weighted sum of inputs. Um, but here, what we're going to do is that our weights themselves are going to be functions of other inputs, OK? So we're going to have a linear module here that takes x, multiplies it by a matrix, and gives us uh, you know, an output vector. But the matrix itself is not a set of parameters. It's the result of applying a linear function to a bunch of, uh, to another vector z, to another matrix u. Okay, so the overall uh, uh, thing. So we're gonna we're gonna write each wij in our linear module as itself as a as a weighted sum, basically, of individual slices of a three dimensional, uh, a third order tensor, right? A three index tensor, u i j k. So this is a multi dimensional array with three dimensions, uh, and we multiply each slice of that tensor by a coefficient, uh, which is a component of zk, the vector zk. That gives us a matrix. And that matrix is wij. And we use that matrix wij to multiply the vector x, OK? So overall, I can write this, write it down this way. S, Si is equal to sum over j and k of uijk, this kind of three-dimensional tensor, times zk time, times xj. This is a quadratic form, right? So basically, things you know. Imagine z is equal to x. This would be kind of a quadratic form, um, but it's basically a second-degree polynomial, if you want, a monomial uh, uh, that's function of uh, x and z through those coefficients, right? Okay, so that gives us a lot of power because it allows us basically to have a little piece of a neural net whose function is determined by another piece of, an, of, of the neural net. Um, it allows us to have switches. It allows us, for example, uh, let's say if X is a, a vector with a bunch of components, we could design this whole thing in such a way that depending on Z, certain components of X would be selected in the weighted sum and some components of X will not be selected in the component by setting some coefficients in W to one or zero. Okay, and that's basically what attention is. Uh, so you might have heard by re reading various things about neural nets that there is this uh, mechanism called attention. It's probably a bad word. What it means is using multiplicative interactions to switch in and out certain variables uh, in, a, in a function that you apply so that the network pays attention to the variable you switch in and doesn't pay attention to the one you switch out. Uh, here's a special case, which I'm going to explain uh, here. Um, and that special case is a switch. Okay, so let's imagine we have a module that has two inputs, x1, x2, and a single output. I'm going to call it s. And depending on some other variables, which I'm not going to specify, uh, this guy either chooses the the first variable or chooses the second variable. Okay, so we can move this switch uh, to, to select x1 or select x2, right? And a module like this, so the switch module, you can think of it as a special case of this uh, product uh, module where uh, the W matrix is either, uh, well, it's not a matrix, it's a, it's, a, it's a row vector, right? So W is equal, either equal to this or is equal to that, okay? And I wanna multiply this by X1, X2. Here I get X1 and here, I get x2, right? So if I have some other variable here, uh, which I, I call z, which is a, a scalar, uh, or is, you know, not a, not a scalar, a, a vector with two variables, two, two components, z1, z2. Uh, 
uh, and I can write uh, if z1 equals one, uh, I get this matrix, is z2 equals zero. And then if z1 equals zero and z2 equal one, I get that matrix. Okay, that would be a way to write the, the u, the u matrix would be a matrix with those two rows, essentially. And the z vector would select uh, one row or the other, depending on whether it's uh, one zero or zero one. And that's like a switch. Now here's a very interesting thing about the switch. It's very easy to backpropagate gradient through a switch. Um, essentially, imagine the switch in the in the first position, so it said x x one. What that means is that uh, when I when I wiggle x by some value, s is going to wiggle by the same value. When I wiggle x two by some value, s is not going to wiggle at all. What that means is that if I get a gradient of some cost with respect to S here. Here, I just copy it. So when I backpropagate to it, I get the same gradient here. And here I get zero. If the switch is in this position, okay? If the switch is in the other position, uh, I get the opposite. I get zero here and I get DC over DS here. So it looks like a switch is an in inherently non-differentiable thing, but it is differentiable with respect to its inputs and outputs. It may not be differentiable with respect to the Z, unless you use kind of a linear uh, uh, way of, of writing it, which, which I did here. Okay, so backpropagating to a switch is very simple. Remember the position of the switch, and then just you know copy the, uh, copy the values, uh, the gradient from the top, uh, with respect to the top, to the inputs that are switched in. Okay, but here's a slightly more interesting form of this attention module, which is probably the most common one. Uh, and it's to basically make the coefficients coming out of, um, uh, make, make a, you know, coefficients basically that sum to one uh, uh, to kind of switch either one slice of, of a U matrix or another slice, which I write here, W1, W2. So think of W1, W2 as slices of, those, of this U matrix. And uh, think of the, the Z's here as the result of a softmax, and you get this kind of module, and it's probably a more convenient way to write it. Uh, so here, I take an X, I multiply it by some matrix um, to get W1X, and you know I get S, and then I have another branch where I take X2, multiplying multiply by another matrix, and I get sum the two results, I get this S, right? So this is a weighted sum, of two inputs multiplied by two separate matrices. Uh, this could be the same input, by the way. Okay, um, doesn't matter at this point. Uh, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, make those, um, uh, sorry, in this case, this, this is for scalar values. So W1, W2 are scalars, okay? And here I'm gonna make W1 and W2 the, output, the outputs of a softmax. So the softmax has uh, two inputs, two outputs, and the two outputs are between zero and one and sum to one. So I get two weights here that are between zero and one and sum to one, okay? So what you get here as, as, as S is a weighted sum of X1 and X2, where the weights are uh, two weights that are between zero and one and sum to one. And so if one of them is one and the other one zero, as a consequence, I, you know, I only get X1 and if, it's the other way around, I only get x2, but for intermediate values, I'm gonna get something in between. Okay, so what this module is going to do is it's going to, to be able to softly switch between paying attention to x1 or paying attention to x2 by either copying x1 into s or copying x2 into s or copying some sort of weighted sum uh, of the two depending on the value of z. Okay, so z is a way to basically uh, control the attention that the system will pay to either X1 or X2. Um, and that turns out to be not only very useful, but basically universally used as a basic module in uh, most uh, natural language processing systems and increasingly also in vision systems. Uh, it's a slightly generalized form of this. Is that clear? Any question at this point? No, so far everything's fine. <laughs>
So think of this as a soft switch, right? I, I told you here about a, a hard switch, okay, that just picks one of the two inputs. Uh, this is one that softly pick one of the two inputs and kind of linearly interpolates between them uh, otherwise. And a bit, an interesting application of this is what's called a mixture of experts. Some of you may have heard of the, the latest uh, uh, gigantic model by, uh, by Google, uh, an enormous NLP system with a trillion parameters. Uh, it's a trillion parameters, but it's actually uh, one of those mixture of experts things. So not all the parameters are used all the time. Um, so let me explain what this is. Let's imagine that you have either a single set of inputs or, or two different inputs here, but let's say it's a single one, X1 and X2 are the same thing. Uh, we'll have two separate neural nets here, which I'll call expert one and expert two, two separate deep learning systems that um, perhaps at ex are expert at a particular type of input, each of them, uh, but not the entire thing. So let's say uh, X, uh, both X1 and X2 are equal, you know, and uh, X is uh, spoken language, let's say, and we want to do speech recognition. Uh, but, uh, but one of our experts can, you know, understand uh, Catalan, which is a language in Northern Spain and Southern France. And the other expert uh, understands Provençal, which is a dialect of uh, kind of Southern French uh, dialect, if you want. Those two languages are actually very similar. Um, they're also similar to Italian, actually, um, and Spanish and French, uh, but French has more German in it. Okay, so, uh, you know, some speech comes in and you don't know if it comes from someone from Provence or someone from Catalonia. Um, so what you want is, uh, you know, to switch in the correct speech recognition system. But you need, uh, you need something to decide whether it's uh, Catalan or Provençal. And so you have another network here that looks at the same input perhaps, or maybe a different input, but maybe the same input. Uh, called a gator, and that gator decides it's got two outputs here in this case, and the two outputs are, you know, one zero if it's Cat Catalan and zero one if it's uh, if it's Provençal, uh, or somewhere in between if it doesn't quite know because many words are very similar and you can't tell in the first few words you know which one it is maybe, uh, or the pronunciation are really similar. So uh, so that softmax thing will basically. Uh, decide on weights with which to combine the two experts so as to make a decision. And initially not knowing uh, which language this is because they are so similar. Uh, you know, you can reuse this example with, you know, your, your local dialects, okay, <laughs> which probably are better examples than uh, Catalan and, and Provençal. Um, so, um, so that's called a mixture of experts. You can have as many of those experts as you want. And basically it says, I have you know, multiple specialized experts and I have a gator that decides in which part of the space each expert is an expert at, okay? And it, it decides to switch in the correct expert at the right time um, uh, for the, the, the current uh, particular input. So uh, let's take a very simple, um, version of this here to kind of visualize this a little bit. Uh, let's say that we have, uh, or input vectors are um, points in a plane, okay? And category one is, uh, is this. And category two is, is that. Okay, so Ideally, let's assume our experts are linear classifiers, okay? So a single layer neural net, basically. What we'd like is one expert to tell us uh, in this part of the space, which category is blue, which one is red, and another linear classifier to tell us in this part of the space, where is blue, where is red. And then what we need is the gator system to tell us so that's going to be another linear classifier. And on, in this part of the space is going to tell us use expert one. And in that part of the space is going to say use expert two. Uh, 
Okay. So very simply here with a mixture of experts, you can do a nonlinear classification with three linear classifiers in parallel, one of which decides which of the experts is the is the proper one to use. Okay. So this is the the discriminative surface from the gator. And this one is uh, for expert one, and that one is for expert two. Uh, but this is not limited to this. You can have huge networks in those experts. You can have modules of this type inside of a, of a network, if you want. Can you tell us about that Z, which is uh, gray? So it's uh, an observation. In this case, it's an observation. So, so here in the example I just showed, uh, the I just drew, you basically have only one variable X, okay? And it goes in parallel to the gator to uh, expert one uh, and uh, expert two. And then the gator has two outputs. Those two outputs are weights between zero and one that sum to one. So you multiply the outputs of each of the experts, which are vectors, by those two, those two things. Uh, and you sum up the results. Okay, so that's the overall architecture. Uh, but this block is this, right? Where you have a softmax here inside, okay? And this is Z, this is X1, and this is X2. Okay, but in general, uh, so I use it here, you know, a particular example where all three inputs are the same, but in general, that's just a module you can stick in your, in your network and do whatever you want. Yes, you can have as many experts as you want. So is the softmax of, of what? Well, so, you know, softmax is a module that takes a bunch of inputs, produces a bunch of outputs, right? So in this case, it takes two inputs and produces two outputs. And so whatever your getter is, uh, you know, you transform those outputs into a bunch of things that are between zero and one and sum to one. And the final question is going to be, and how do you train this gator? And do you train it separately or? You just do backprop. You don't have to worry about it. Just backprop a gradient through this. Okay. So the question is, how do you do backprop? <laughs> you don't have to think about it. You just write this, right? Uh, <laughs> um, you could try to be smart about it, but the best thing is to not be smart about it and just propagate gradients, right? This is a graph as we've written a few other graphs. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, okay, let me, let me, let me draw this, right? So, so this is whatever, this is a neural net of some kind. Uh, this is another neural net of some kind. This is another neural net of some kind. Doesn't matter what kind. Okay. And then here. Okay, so I'm writing this explicitly as multiplications, but really this is sort of a multiplicative module of the type that we talked about. Okay, and it's just an addition. Okay, and you get you get some output, let's call it Y bar. You plug this to a cost function. Uh, which takes a desired output y. Right. Um, now I can uh, encapsulate this into a single module. Doesn't matter. What I'm just telling you is that there needs to be a softmax at the output, but you know, it's just an architecture, whatever it is that you want. Um, so, how do we backpropagate gradient? We don't have to think about it. That's the, that's the cool thing about automatic differentiation and PyTorch and all those things, uh, TensorFlow and all those things. You just write your module uh, this way, okay? You say, my output is the sum of uh, this variable 
multiplied by that variable uh, plus this variable, this variable multiplied by that variable. Okay, and that variable, those variables are equal to a softmax, you know, computed from, from Z through some neural net. And those two variables are computed with F1, F2. So you just write this, right? You just write this as a function, as a program. You know, it's a few lines, right, in PyTorch. Um, and automatically, PyTorch will figure out how to backpropagate gradient. So basically, it's going to say, OK, I'm going to get some gradient here of my cost here, dc over dy bar, right? Uh, which is going to be some value. Um, here, because this is a plus module, when you backpropagate through an addition, you basically have to copy the, the gradient on both inputs. So here I'm going to get dc over dy uh, bar, the same value. It's going to be the same value copied. When I backpropagate through a multiplication by uh, a, a value, let's, let me call this w2, here I get w2 times dc over dy bar. Here I get, this is if this is w1, here I get w1 times dc over dy bar, OK? And then I take those, this is a vector, I, and I, I backpropagate it through the network. And we've already seen how we backpropagate through neural nets, right? So you know it's going to happen inside here, doesn't matter. And you're going to get a gradient with respect to the weights of this guy, which I'm going to call, I don't know, theta 3, theta 2, and this is theta 1. Now, to backpropagate through this branch, um, it's the same thing. What, what I'm going to get here, so let me call this uh, z3, z2. OK, so the, the gradient I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have here is going to be equal to uh, z3 times dc over d y bar, because I have a product of two variables. So the when I have uh, a variable equal to the product of, uh, uh, you know, in this case, z1 and z3, OK, uh, when I have dc over dz1, is equal to dc over d y, which is the, I mean, I shouldn't call the, call, I shouldn't call this y, I'm sorry. Uh, I should call this something else because it's going to get confusing. Uh, okay. So this would be this, this variable here, uh, which I'm going to call uh, v, okay, v3, right? So v3 is equal to z1, z3, right? Uh, because, well, it's equal to W. I'm, I'm being extremely confusing here. Uh, w2, z3. And again, my numbers are horrible. So, so when I differentiate a product with respect to the first variable, uh, I get dc over dv3 times uh, dv3 over dw2. And that's that part uh, is the derivative of this with respect to w2, and that's equal to z3, right? So I get dc over dv3 uh, times z3. And if I now differentiate with respect to V3, going through the same process, I get DC um, uh, to, uh, to Z3, I'm, I'm sorry. I get DC over DV3, which I know, times W2. Right, so if I have a gradient here, which is DC over DV3, when I backpropagate through this product, in this branch, I get the product of this gradient by this weight. And when I backpropagate through this branch, I get the product of this gradient by this value, which is that. OK? And it's just, you know, simple derivatives. Um, so then you will get a gradient with respect to those two outputs at the output of the softmax, 
you backpropagate through the softmax and then backpropagate through this other function. But you don't have to worry about it. PyTorch is going to do it for you. Uh, so here's an exercise. Interesting exercise, which I think will help you understand a lot of things. Uh, let's say we have a softmax module, okay? So zi equals e to the beta xi divided by sum over j, j of e to the beta xj, okay? Let's assume that I know dc over dzi, okay? Compute dc over dx, k for any k. Okay, all those guys are known. What are those guys? Right, so what you can write is that they're, they're going to be equal to uh, D uh, to sum over I of DZI over DXK times DC over DZI. Okay, this is chain wall, right? We explained this last week. And the question is, what is this? So this is a Jacobian. of the softmax. Okay, it's a matrix, um, you know, J, I, K. Um, for each index has, each pair of index I, K has the partial derivative of the ith output of the softmax with respect to the kth input of the softmax. And it's a very good exercise to compute this, okay? I very much encourage you to do this. It's very easy to find a solution. You can find this in, you know, uh, various places on the web, uh, but it's much more fun to actually figure it out by yourself. Uh, you'll learn something by doing it. And we tell you like, how do you backpropagate to a softmax, okay? Um, Okay, here's something a little more complicated as if that wasn't complicated enough. And it's uh, reparameterizing the parameters. So it, this is kind of a bit of a slightly more general uh, way of uh, kind of instance of, of what I was just talking about of you know products, uh, product units where uh, weight matrix is the result of you know weighted sum of uh, slices of a tensor. So here, I'm sort of making this a little more general. I'm saying, imagine that we have uh, a network, G of X and W, but the Ws are not parameters that we can adjust. They are themselves the result of applying a deep learning system to a set of more elementary parameters, U, elementary variables, U, okay? So this is a, an example of a neural net whose weights are the output of another neural net, if you want, okay? So this looks like a, a totally hairy thing, but it actually it actually used very very commonly and uh, in in very simplified forms or in in more general forms. Uh, and again, you know, it's interesting to understand how that works. But uh, in the end, PyTorch takes takes care of that for you. So uh, we have a neural net here. It takes an input, applies some complex deep learning system to it, G of XW, or maybe it's simple. You get an output uh, uh, prediction Y bar. Uh, plug this into a cost function of some kind, uh, log softmax, whatever. 
uh, with a desired output, okay? But then the W is another input uh, to that system. It's not an internal parameter. It's, a, it's another input, another variable. That is the output of some function HU that itself has inputs or parameters that uh, we're gonna learn. So these might be either learn parameters or inputs from some other source, okay? Let's say they are learned parameters, which is why I circled them in red. Okay, so when we back propagate gradient, you know, we have a gradient of the cost function with respect to y bar. We uh, have two Jacobian matrices here for g of x, w. One of them is gonna give us the gradient of g of x, w with respect to x, which we don't care about very much. And the other one is gonna give us the gradient of g of x, w, of the gradient of, of the, the cost function with respect to uh, to W, okay? So that gives us, let's assume we make, we interpret W as a vector. It could be a matrix or a tensor, but it doesn't matter. We interpret it as a vector. And uh, we're gonna get a gradient vector of the same dimension that you know indicates the partial derivative of, that, of, of C with respect to all components of W. And then we're gonna back propagate that through H and that's gonna give us gradients with respect to U, okay? We can make an update of U Using, using this. So because the gradient with respect to U is the product of the Jacobian matrix of G with respect to W and the Jacobian matrix of U with respect to U, we get this formula, okay? So U is updated by uh, a quantity here, eta times the uh, gradient of the cost function with respect to W times the Jacobian of uh, H with respect to U, okay? This is, the gradient of W with respect to you, to you really. So this is going to result in a up, you know update of, of U, and we can think of this as an update on W. And because W is a function of U through this H function, we can compute what the update on W will be, and it's basically the update on U multiplied by I mean up, to which we apply uh, H of U. But if the update is infinitesimally small, then the update will basically be uh, the, the, the Jacobian of, of H again. So the implied learning rule on W, okay, which is just uh, something we can look at um, without really worrying about it, because as I said, you know, PyTorch takes care of this. You know, this is just backprop, there's nothing more to it. Um, but if you want to see the equivalent result of doing gradient descent in U, what effect is it going to have on W? It's going to have this effect. So it's as if, we would apply a gradient-based learning rule to W where the gradient update would be compute the gradient of the cost with respect to W and then multiply this gradient by this big matrix here, which is the Jacobian of H multiplied by its own transpose. So this is a positive semi-definite matrix. Uh, and then multiply that by the step size, okay? And in gradient descent, if you multiply the, the gradient by a positive semi-definite matrix, you're still doing gradient descent. It doesn't make any difference to the fact that you're doing gradient descent. So basically you're doing gradient descent in U, but as a side effect, you are actually doing gradient descent in W just with a different direction where the gradient is transformed by this matrix. This particular point we'll come back to uh, in a few weeks when we talk about optimization. Uh, but the whole idea of, uh, of this, uh, having the weights function of another thing that's used a lot. Um, here is an example where it's used, weight sharing. So let's say that uh, H of U is a very simple function that takes a single variable U, a scalar variable, and duplicates it into multiple copies, right? So it makes it into a vector where all the components of the vector have the same value. Okay. So essentially, we have some sort of big network here. It goes into a cost function of some kind. Uh, and here we have a single variable U and we have a module, which is basically a duplication module that just copies that variable U into multiple copies of itself. 
Okay. It's a Y cable, right? You need to, uh, you know, connect your multiple headphones to your music player, right? You need a Y cable. Okay. So it just copies the, the signal. Um, here I say that U is a, uh, and, and I'm going to call this W, the, this, this collection. So to get the gradient of the cost function with respect to U, what do I need to do? In other words, how do you backpropagate gradient through a module that does nothing but just copy a bunch of variables? Okay. So let me, let me take a very simple example. And Z1 is equal to U and Z2 is equal to U, okay? So if I have the, gra the gradient of some cost function with respect to Z1, what is going to be the gradient of this cost function with respect to U? And the answer is, the sum of those two gradients. Why is that? Okay, it's very easy to understand. Um, first of all, it's a direct consequence of the general form of uh, chain rule, which, is, uh, which I wrote last week, which is that if you have a variable that influences multiple variables, uh, the, the gradient of some cost function, some, some subsequent cost function with respect to this variable is the sum of the gradient with respect to each of the variables that it influences times the, the, the derivative of uh, each of those variables with respect to, to itself. And this is just a special case. Why is that? If I perturb u by delta u, it's gonna perturb z by delta u and z1 by delta u and z2 also by delta u, right? So as a consequence, c, the delta c is gonna be uh, equal to, uh, I'm gonna write it this way is gonna be equal to uh, uh, dc over dz1 delta z1, which is delta u, plus dc over dz2 delta z2, which is also delta u, okay? Um, and so no, now, you know, I'm gonna write those deltas as, as Ds really. I mean, there are infinitesimal quantities. So I can write, so I can divide both sides by, uh, by du. And I get dz over dz1 plus dc over dz2. Okay, so a module that divides, uh, I mean, that copies a variable into multiple copies when you backpropagate to it, you just compute the sum of the gradients. It's as simple as that. Okay, so in this little example here, if I get a vector of gradient uh, of the cost with respect to W, I just sum them up and I get the gradient with respect to U, right? So DC over DU equals sum over I of DC over DWI, very simple. But again, PyTorch is gonna take care of that for you. Why am I telling you this? This is a very interesting special case. Uh, and this is a preview of uh, uh, basically the trick that's using convolutional nets, uh, which we're gonna talk about next week. So let's say we want uh, a system to detect a motif, okay? So detecting a motif might mean detecting a face in an image, for example, or detecting uh, a particular key phrase in a, in a speech uh, sentence. Uh, so let's say you are Amazon or, or Google or Facebook, and you know, you're supposed to detect, uh, you know, you're supposed to have a very simple neural net that just you know, listens to the speech signal and detects, hey Google, or detects uh, Alexa, or detects, uh, uh, you know, hey Facebook or hey portal. Now here's the thing, I just said, hey Google, and of course my phone woke up. Um, or you want a face detector and you have you know, an image and basically you have a little neural net that you train to be a face detector and you'd like to apply it to every location in the image, right? Uh, 
uh, we like to train it in that in that situation. We don't necessarily know where the where the face is, uh, or you are I don't know uh, you're playing in the stock market and you want to you know detect a particular motif in the variation of a set of financial values regardless of when they happen in your sequence. So what you need is a neural net that looks at a, a set of inputs, you know, uh, a piece of an image, a segment of a signal, whether it's speech or financial values or whatever it is. Uh, and you need to kind of slide it over your sequence of inputs uh, and basically, you know, your detector to kind of turn on wherever it needs to be uh, to be turned on. And you can think of this as essentially different copies of the same neural net that all share the same weights. Okay, so you have one weight vector that is used by all of those neural nets. But when you're going to copy, when you're going to, when you're going to back propagate gradient through this, uh, each of those neural nets is going to contribute a gradient to whatever objective function you're minimizing. Okay, and the way to compute the the gradient, uh, the overall gradient with respect to W, is just to sum up the individual contributions of the gradient from each of those instances of those uh, replicas, okay? So this is nothing more than an example of this kind of, you know, fan out uh, Y connector where one set of variables is used multiple times. And because it's used multiple times, when I back propagate, I'm gonna get multiple gradients for each of those multiple times. I sum up those gradients and I get the gradient with respect to, uh, to that variable. Is that clear? Questions? No questions. Actually, we are out of time, actually. We're pretty much out of time, yes. Yeah. Uh, but that's pretty much where I wanted to be. So That's great. So we see everyone on uh, in class tomorrow for the PyTorch part, where we're actually going to be using PyTorch finally for training a network. And you will see how uh, running backprop is very easy. And we will be releasing the homework right after uh, the lab, such that you have actually all the knowledge to start working. Right. That's and it. so remember the, uh, the, uh, the exercise I, I, I gave you here, computing the, you know, backpropagating through softmax. It's a, it's a good exercise. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I've been writing on the chat that, you know, those exercises you're giving are, you know, very encouraged. <laughs> right. Um, I'll put the, the whiteboard, uh, PDF version of the whiteboard on the drive so you have record of it. Okay, thanks. That's great. All right. See you, everyone. Bye-bye.